This is Twit. The big report was, like last month, as we're recording this, um, basically that Russia has a new secret weapon that they could they could blow up satellites or who knows what in space. What's going on that we know about like right now? Can you give us like a, an overview of what we know? Well, the good news is that according to the White House, there's no immediate threat to anyone's safety, right? They're not saying that this is some kind of weapon that's hanging in the air above us with a nuke ready to come down. Um, there's been a lot of chatter over the past few weeks, but from most of the experts, it seems like what we're talking about is some sort of nuclear powered anti-satellite weapon, mm -hmm. maybe a nuclear powered uh, electronic warfare platform. Um, there have been a lot of great reports um, that people have done over the last five years to show that a lot of Russian industry has been working on this one particular design of this large nuclear powered electronic warfare satellite. And what it could do is kind of disable a wide area of radio communications. It can jam satellites across a wide area. So that's one potential option. Like now, an also, EMP or some other kind of active jamming thing? More like an active jamming, like you okay. know, radio frequency jamming, that kind of thing. Although, uh, to your point there, there's also some speculation that maybe Russia's looking to revive the decades-old concept of actually detonating a nuclear weapon in space, mm -hmm. which would be even more catastrophic across a larger area of satellites in orbit. Now, And, and this is all still classified it seems like it's kind of like a fluke that we know about it right so how how did that That's thing right. become public in the first place yeah the intelligence itself is classified but on february 14th the chair of the house permanent select committee on intelligence mike turner a republican from ohio he issued a public statement asking president biden to declassify all the information that we have on this threat so that we can openly discuss how to respond to it Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of back and forth with other congressmen. I think the, the next day there was a White House press conference because it just, you know, the headlines just exploded. The story went crazy wide. So that's how we know about it. It's all because of, you know, Mike Turner putting this out there. And there's been some speculation that maybe him even leaking that little bit of information might have been somehow politically motivated to drum up military funding to kind of help push Congress towards uh, approving some military spending bills, but mm -hmm. we don't really know. That's all speculation. Okay. So like, like, like spending for Ukraine or, or That's something right. like that. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, there, there's been a lot of back and forth on whether or not we should continue funding Ukraine at the rate we've been going at. And so obviously this big Russian threat that, you know, might tip Congress in one direction. However, in that, White House press conference, we did learn there is actually intelligence about an actual, you know, Russian nuclear space weapon. Okay. But again, everything's pointing towards it being nuclear powered. Like a, right like a, like a reactor is what you're talking about. So you don't yes. want anyone to worry that there's this giant, there's, there's a movie from the eighties <laughs> called DEFCON four or five. I'm not sure if have you ever seen that movie. I don't think called? so. It's absolutely awful. It's like one of the worst sci-fi yeah. movies I've ever seen. But but the whole point is it's it's these two guys that are stationed on an orbital platform that just launches nuclear weapons down at the earth. And of course, you know, it's it's an apocalypse movie, so it all happens and then right. they crash and everyone's fighting over their their crashed spaceship. Um but that's not what you're talking about. It's not like that. It's like a something that would it would you would if if it's nuclear powered, I guess the point is that it needs a lot of power, so that's what they would they would use that for uh, right. and then they could keep it up there for a long time because nuclear powered stuff lasts for a long time uh in right space. yeah yeah you know electronic warfare kind of these non-kinetic means of disabling satellites they do require a lot of power if you want to jam a wide band of radio frequencies over a long period of time it's going to take a lot of energy and so a nuclear reactor could be one way to power something that could stay on orbit for a long time and, and mm -hmm. really disable communications across a wide area. Uh, and nuclear, Russia, oh, go ahead. You know, Russia has signaled that it would like the capability to disable Western satellite constellations because, you know, Starlink, uh, SpaceX's Starlink mega constellation has been used widely throughout Ukraine to provide mm -hmm. battlefield communications and government communications for the government of Ukraine. We had some statements come out several months ago from the Russian government that it considers even commercial satellites operated by the West as legitimate targets in wartime. Huh. Um, so this 
capability, the ability to destroy, disable, or degrade Western satellites is something we know Russia and other nations like China are very actively pursuing. To put it in perspective, because like you said, the White House was very adamant and, and the Defense Department, too, because there were some briefings uh, that we were following there, um, said many times that it isn't like a current threat, like it's not something that's going to happen right now. It's not something that's in space right now that we that we know of. Uh, but it sounds like the ability to knock out or interfere with satellites at a scale that was described by uh, by these officials. Um, I mean, it sounds like that could be a pretty damaging blow to just how we live. You and I are talking right now through, through like internet that gets bounced all around through communication satellites or, or, uh, or, or when we travel and we use GPS and all of that. I mean, that, that stuff seems like, uh, uh, a, a pretty, a pretty large array of vulnerable systems because they don't have any kind of defenses built into them, right? All these commercial satellites, they're just designed to do the thing that they're built to do. Yeah. Today's satellites are a little more hardened against radiation than the ones, say, 60 years ago. But to your point, yes, uh, GPS satellites, all sorts of telecommunication satellites, you know, would be entirely vulnerable. Many of mm -hmm. these don't have the ability to change the orbits or maneuver out of the way in any way. Um, it's for those reasons, the Pentagon has said and Pentagon leadership has said in, in recent months that space is the most vital domain for the U.S. military right now because we depend on it at every level for all the things we just talked about. Navigation, position, timing, communications, uh, early warning for missile launches, all, all of those things. So, yeah, we if our satellites were taken out, if any nation's satellites were taken out, they'd be basically blind, deaf and dumb to a large extent. Yeah, I found. Yeah. And, and John, uh, for your records th there on line 43, I did find like a, a whole statement from the Defense Department uh, about uh, 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 basically saying that uh, <clears throat> space. Uh, well, th that one is about hypersonic weapons. Pardon me. It's line 42 is 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 the is the is the report that I had found where they were saying that the um, space based threats from competitors were like the biggest thing that we have to worry about. And that was back in 2022. And that was two years ago. So it sounds like it's just heating up. Brett, <laughs> from, oh, yeah. from what you're describing here. That's right. And you, I mean, you just have to look at the launch cadence that the U.S. Space Force, these national security launches, they're going mm -hmm. up more often. They're going up more rapidly. We saw the uh, Victus Knox mission last year in which the Space Force was able to turn around a satellite in a matter of days, right? They ordered it, got it on the rocket, sent it up, and they want to even increase that. Uh, there's another one coming up in which they want to shorten that window to hours, you know. Well, I want to I want to ask about the military actions in space because I have some treaty questions for you, yeah. uh, right. too. But but you brought up a really good point about just the military wrapping up its own actions here to to do surveillance, to do uh, reconnaissance uh, uh, and, and, and defense. Of course, we have missile defense satellites, which are designed to detect uh, uh, launches from uh, potential, um, uh, what do you want to call them? Potential adversaries. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, but military participation in space, that's not new. That's been going on right since the dawn of the space age. It was right. <laughs> the, the first astronauts were purely from military backgrounds, uh, that, that we had as well as in Russia and the Soviet that's Union. That's right. And, you know, some experts will argue that the entire space age is entirely a military operation. There's a fantastic book that came out last year by Bled and Bowen called Original Sin that delves all into this. But, yeah, you know, the, the original rocket technologies, they were derived from, you know, uh, military missile technologies. Mm -hmm. And um, even the, the whole concept of, of putting nuclear weapons in space goes back over 60 years. So, yeah, there's... What, and was that just to put the weapons in space for quick strike or to make stations where we're going to leap, put them up there and, I guess, aim them down at Earth from the moon? Well, as far as we know, it wasn't that nefarious. <laughs> but as far back as 1959, the U.S. tested an anti-satellite missile that was intended to have a nuclear warhead. Wow. Well, they never did put a nuclear warhead on it. But, yeah, 1959, this goes all the way back to that. So... You know, for 60 years, we've known that one of the best ways to take out satellites was with a nuclear detonation in space. And back then, we didn't have 
the precision guided missiles we have today. So a, a big explosion in space was the best way they had to do mm-hmm. it. Luckily, President Eisenhower at the time took a look at it and said, you know, this isn't a good idea. And they scaled back. But however, just three years later in 1962, as part of what was known as Operation Fishbowl, the U.S. Air Force conducted a test called Starfish Prime. Huh. And uh, about southwest of Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, over Johnson Atoll, a little series of islands out there, they detonated a, around a 1.4 megaton warhead at an altitude of 250 miles, 400 kilometers. That's where the space station flies. <laughs> 250 yeah. miles up, yeah. It, it was wild. When you see pictures and videos of it, I mean, it, it turned night into day. It created auroras on the other side of the world, on the other wow. hemisphere. It, um, um, street lights on the ground below went out, and uh, it's estimated about a quarter of the satellites that were in orbit at the time suffered some kind of damage. And, uh, and they did, that was only one of five that they did as part of Operation Fishbowl. <laughs> so five th- tests. <laughs> we'll have yeah. to get... We'll have to get some links for that so that folks can follow up on that because that is crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. So, and they, did they launch all five of those tests like one after another or were they like kind of spread out over like a few? Yeah, months? they were kind of spread out, um, but they all took place in the span of a couple of years right then in the early 1960s. And so uh, it, it's because of those tests that we know a lot about what the effects of detonating a nuclear weapon in space would be today. Mm-hmm. I, it's just, it's hard to imagine even contemplating that kind of a test like right now because, because you yeah. can't hide any of that stuff with the types of satellite surveillance that we've got going on uh, these days. Well, I actually have uh, a lot of questions about if it's even legal to do a lot of this stuff. I did have one just to follow up because you mentioned uh, early on uh, that this potential weapon capability would be nuclear powered rather than uh, rather than like an, like a missile or a, or a bomb or whatnot. Uh, yeah. And that seems like it's not new either, nuclear re- reactors in space. I mean, th- there, were, there were some nuclear-powered satellites even uh, during the, um, the early days of the space race, right? Sure. And to go back to the Voyager probes we talked about earlier, right? These mm-hmm. are um, radioisotope thermal generators. Is that what they're called? Yeah, radioisotope. Um, so, <laughs> which is not quite the same as a nuclear reactor, right? They, they use the heat generated as an isotope, a radioactive isotope decays. Mm -hmm. Um, But that, you know, you can still consider that nuclear powered in a way, but uh, it seems like what this new Russian capability might be is an actual nuclear reactor. Okay. And, you know, DARPA is pursuing the DARPA and NASA are pursuing a nuclear powered propulsion system. So, um, you know, Russia's not alone in that, but yeah, the nuclear powered rocket, that concept goes back, I mean, to the dawn of rocketry, basically. (laughs) You know, because the space age was the same as the atomic age, right? All of these technologies were being developed kind of at the same time. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.